All right, hello friends and welcome back to the podcast. Today is a first in the history of the What If Project because we have not just one guest on the show today, not just two guests, but we have three guests joining us today. We have Aaron Vernicombe, Brandon Scott, and Hal Tossig. And so welcome all three of you. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to share this space with you. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So Aaron, Brandon, and Hal wrote a book together called After Jesus, Before Christianity. And the subtitle is A Historical Exploration of the First Two Centuries of Jesus Movements. And as our listeners can imagine, I have all sorts of questions for them. Uh, but before we get into that, how about the three of you tell us a small bit about yourselves, especially for people who maybe aren't too familiar with you and your work. Uh, who are you? What do you do? All that kind of stuff. Who wants to kick it off? We'll go around the horn. <laughs> Let Aaron go first. All right, I'll get us started. All right. So hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Aaron Verncombe, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And at U of T, I'm actually a specialist in writing instruction for undergraduates, and I help first year students make the transition to university level writing. And my academic background is in study of religion. I have a PhD um, through a, a collaborative program through U of T's Center for Jewish Studies and Department for the Study of Religion with a special focus on the uh, first two centuries of the common era and the, the social realities of the common era. I've been particularly interested in the everyday realities of social life. And I wrote an, a dissertation on dress actually in the gospels of Mark, Luke and Matthew called What Would Jesus Wear? So I like those social details awesome. like food and clothes and that kind of thing. Yeah, those little details can tell us a lot, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brandon Scott, and I am delighted to be here. I am the Darbeth Distinguished Professor of New Testament Emeritus at Phillips Theological Seminary. Uh, I've been at this a long time. <laughs> and I started off uh, in parables uh, and have kind of expanded into Paul and then into the second and third, and now a little bit into the fourth century, hmm. uh, trying to just follow out a series of problems uh, on how we got to where we are. And hmm. I'll never get there, but I'm working my way <laughs> towards it. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm Hal Tausig. I'm um, relatively newly retired from uh, a dual career one uh, being a professor and uh, in religion, and uh, two being a pastor of, a, of several local churches. My uh, work, uh, my last 20 years of, of work in the academy it was at the Union Theological Seminary in New York. Hmm. And uh, it was near the beginning of my time at Union that I made a fairly strong shift in what I was studying. I had been a, an, am a, a professor of New Testament and early Christianity, but it became slowly, um, real slowly clear to me that I had not paid any attention to the 150 new documents that have been discovered in the last 100 years or so. And so I shifted gears Earned um, or learned a, a new um, uh, language or two um, because many of those were in, in Coptic. Um, and um, I've been working on that primarily ever since. That's awesome. You've also put together one of my favorite resources, the New New Testament, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Thank you. I point a lot of people in the direction of that. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's jump into the, the book. There is, uh, there is so much to talk about and so little time <laughs> to discuss it all. Uh, but what I did was I, for our listeners, I combed through the book. I read through my highlights. I dog ear pages in my book. I'm, I'm one of those people that marks up their books when they, when they read it. But I went through everything I had, all the notes, and I landed on these three topics to talk to you about. I thought that maybe each person could kind of take one topic, you can dialogue around the topic, whatever it is that you want to do. But I, even before we get to that, 
I think maybe a good place to start and sort of lay a foundation for the discussion is, can you tell us about the experiment that you talk about in chapter one? Because it's really from that place, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like that's for where this book was birthed from, is from this experiment. So I'd love to hear maybe a little bit more about that, especially for our listeners who maybe haven't read the book. Exactly. I can jump in here. Thank so you. So the, the experiment is, it's really a big what if question. So yes. this is a, a perfect if. match for us, <laughs> this, uh, this podcast. <laughs> um, and it came out of the, the amazing work of scholars and researchers who have been part of the Christianity Seminar with the West Art Institute for the past number of years. And we, we wanted to ask this big what if question. What mm. if we studied the first two centuries of the common era, trying not to assume anything about a, a Christian future. So the future is not inevitable. Um, what if we tried to begin our research, not, not looking backwards with what we already know or think we know and trying to fit ourselves into the past, but what if we read forward, trying to keep our assumptions at bay as much as possible and, and to be open to the possibilities of a future. That's how I'd frame our experiment. Mm. I think that's, that's, she, that's really right. I, I think the thing to maybe add a little bit is we have traditionally looked back to the first century from the point of view of the fourth century from the way it came out uh, in what, what gets formed as orthodoxy. And therefore, we have a tendency to assume that that was all there from the beginning. Yes. Uh, and that's not the case. Hmm. That's the fourth century. It's not the first century. And so the experiment is to strip that away and to remember that the people living this had no idea where it was going hmm. or whether it would go anywhere. Many of them thought it would end rather quickly yeah. and that it kept going on was a bit of a surprise. Mm. So, I mean, we were trying to capture that sense of randomness that is your actual everyday experience of reality. Mm. Uh, if you just think about the, today, we're living in utter chaos mm. right now around the world. If you pick up the New York Times or any newspaper, you just want to put it down. We don't know where it's going. Yeah. In 30 years, they'll know where it went yeah so we tried to write the experiment is to read it forward not to read it backwards mm. that's really good. and and glenn we had really uh, quite a bunch of surprises in the 10 years that we were studying this but i think one of the most amazing things for for us especially as a threesome was that we um, now, when, when you um, do the first two centuries, you have such variety um, for, uh, in all kinds of texts and all kinds of um, people. And so uh, that there's a possibility in the first two centuries that um, whatever comes next might actually be mostly about diversity um, rather than sameness. Yeah. And, and that, I think, for, for us in many ways, is one of the most exciting um, things that, that we discovered as we unfold. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think looking back on my own seminary education, there was, it was almost like assumed that there was this one steady stream of thought that dated back to, you know, the apostles. And we, that's just the way that it is. And, but like you said, I think with Brandon, has said it, you know, we, we tend to look back at those early centuries through the lens of the fourth century. I think when we do that, to your point, we miss a tremendous amount. It was, I think Bart Ehrman wrote the book, uh, was it called Early Christianities, plural? And that like really blew my mind when I first picked it up. I'm like, what do you mean Christianities? Like there's more than one. <laughs> I thought there's only one, you know? But I think that, you know, this book and what you just said brings out a, a huge amount of stuff that we've missed. Bart's title is very interesting, but it misses the point. There are no, mm. there is no Christianity. Mm. There's not only not Christianities, there is no Christianity. Yeah. So you have to really begin to raffle with that problem that what we identify as 
Christianity as a separate religion yeah. is a product of the third, fourth, and fifth centuries, huh. not the first two centuries. And we're getting radical here right off the bat. <laughs> I like it. I well, like it. We're being historical. Yes, I like it. I like it. So first big question of the three I wanted to talk to you about is the concept of gender. Um, in the book, there's a, a couple of chapters that are dedicated to this, this topic. I was wondering if maybe you could talk to us a little bit about uh, how these ancient communities might have challenged uh, the gender assumptions of their day, and maybe a little bit about how that could inspire us in 2022, all these years later, to challenge our own gender assumptions, maybe not just in our society, uh, but also in our churches and in our faith traditions. That's such a great question, especially because gender continues to be such a powerful social force in our lives and, yep. and continues to, to shape us in lots of different ways and, and continues to do a lot of damage to us as well yeah. in different kinds of ways. So gender, gender functioned differently in the first two centuries than it does now. It, it looked a, a little different. Um, people understood the body and what the body was differently than we understand it now, but it was still a dominant force in people's lives. And, and again, it could uh, both provide um, support for, for changing people's lives, but it also did a lot of damage to, to people's lives. So mm. the more we looked at these diverse communities in the first two centuries, the more we saw people experimenting with the social construct of gender um, in lots of interesting ways. In, in some cases, communities could use gender as a tool to reinforce social boundaries. Gender was particularly important when it came to group identity and, and group boundaries, figuring out who your group was, how it was shaped and how it related to the larger world, especially the world under Roman Empire. So gender could be an effective tool if, if you wanted to fit in to your larger surroundings, fit into the social norms of life under empire. And we certainly see that in the writings of, of some of these communities. But gender also became a powerful tool um, to negotiate group identity and, and to challenge social norms as well. Um, one of the most exciting examples that we talk about in, in the book is the Gospel of Mary. Um, and, uh, and Mary in, in this writing is uh, such a powerful figure. She's the leader of a community. She's a teacher. She's a seer. She's very, very close to the Savior, which is the name given to, to Jesus in this text. And when you see the power of Mary and the gospel of Mary compared to a text like the first letter of Timothy, for example, a, a writing that we might be more familiar with, we can see just how different um, models of gender were and, and how groups were using gender in, in very different ways. First Timothy is a text that uses gender as a way of policing people and policing bodies, mm. uh, making sure that bodies were, were conforming to um, a specific set of, of social norms. Mm -hmm. We also looked at the writings that we now call the martyr writings, the mm -hmm. stories of people who, um, people who we also call them noble death stories mm -hmm. or witness stories. Um, and gender in, in these stories is just so, um, it's really fascinating. So we see the individuals we now call martyrs um, really turning gender upside down, not just bending gender, but essentially um, just reversing it. So we see um, we see conventional models of gender like Roman manliness, which was associated with uh, with courage and violence and, and penetration. And we see the bodies of martyrs totally, subverting that norm and, and showing a, a new definition of courage. Courage is uh, suffering. Courage is humility. Yeah. So when we're thinking about gender, we're thinking about this kind of constellation of, of values and, and ideas that goes along with it um, and how people could manipulate those values in certain kinds of ways to find a sense of belonging within their communities. Mm. 
Yeah. The gospel of Mary is, is something I've been reading a lot about lately. And that was one of the off limit texts that I was told about in seminary. And of course, once I started asking all the questions I've been asking, that was one of the first texts I went to (laughs) because I was told not to read it. And I've been reading like what Karen King has to say about it and some other people. And it's really interesting to see just how different it is from a text, like you said, first Timothy. Now, what I want to ask you about that is first Timothy, I believe is the consensus, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was not written by Paul, correct? It was written much after Paul. And so was this text written in response to Paul? And maybe Brandon might be talking about that later, whoever's going to kind of talk about Paul, but is that like a text that, because Paul seems very radical to me when I read like the letters that he was, that were attributed to him. And so was this text kind of written, you think, to kind of tone him down a little bit in terms of gender? like exception or is my question making sense? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to let Brandon speak to the Paul question later. Um, It's, it's hard to determine what kind of relationship that particular community might or might not have had with Paul. But Mm -hmm. I think what excites me about this text is the, um, the commands towards not just women but but male bodies are policed in this text as well but Mm. um women are told that uh they're supposed to be silent they are not supposed to be active in in the community not supposed to have a a prominent voice that suggests to me that women in the community were trying to assert that kind of power and were assuming that kind of power so um you don't tell someone not to do something unless they are doing it in the first place so (laughs) The exciting implication for me here is that there were um, active women leaders in, in this community who were um, potentially causing some problems with uh, with outsiders, yeah. uh, people who uh, were concerned about the activities of this particular group. Yeah. So how would you say then, kind of like the second part of that, that question about gender, how can that inspire us today? Like if we read the Gospel of Mary uh, and we mm-hmm. look at kind of what that has to say concerning uh, the involvement of, of women in leadership, things like that. How can we use that to inspire us to challenge those gender assumptions in our own churches, our own faith traditions today? Mm-hmm. Well, first, I, I do really want to encourage people to make use of resources like uh, Hal's New New Testament, because there are so many writings in there that um, I, I think could really change us and, and our relationships yeah. to our, our different traditions. When we're looking at the first two centuries, there is no testament. So there is no um, authoritative collection of, of writings that. You mean God were... didn't hand it down from heaven <laughs> to us? <laughs> oh boy. Um, so we, in, in the book, we you know, acknowledging that there was no yeah. New Testament in this time period, we try to treat these writings uh, equally. First Timothy is is no more important to us in a historical right. context than the Gospel of Mary. These are two very different writings okay. that were important to probably very different communities in, in different kinds of ways. So um, it's really important to consider how we're privileging evidence from the first two centuries and making sure, again, that we're not reading um we're not reading the future backwards into that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Um, There are all kinds of of writings that celebrate and subvert and challenge gender in in really amazing ways um, that I I think that we could really benefit from having greater access to. Um, I think it's also really important to see gender um, in these writings, because it will help us to to see gender, I think, in our own interactions, um, make us more self aware of how we also use gender um, every day, whether we're aware of it or not. And, and hopefully, um, what we're doing here will make us more aware of how we might be using gender again to um, maybe shore up our social situations and and maybe challenge them as well. It's it's a tool that affects us all, whether we like it or not. Gender gender shapes us all um, every single day. Um, And being aware of that and being aware of of what's in our power in terms of of using 
um, subverting these kinds of norms, I think, um, is, you know, it, it it's hard, yeah. um, but it's, it's exciting yeah. as well. Yeah, it's really good. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing all that. Uh, second question for you has to do with uh, the hot topics of Gnosticism and, and heresy. And uh, I, like a lot of our listeners, as I mentioned, was brought up in a very conservative evangelical world. So uh, private Christian school for me from the fourth through 12th grades with Bible class every Thursday, chapel every Wednesday, all those different things, uh, Bible college, seminary, uh, pastor to church, the whole nine yards. And I was always taught that this was a very, you know, black and white issue. You have orthodoxy, good, and Gnosticism, bad. <laughs> and orthodoxy is truth, and Gnosticism is lies. And it was about secret knowledge. It was about having a deep hate and disdain for the body and the world, and it should be avoided at all costs, because it's the worst thing ever. It was almost, I think you mentioned it in the book, it was like this monster that's hiding around the corner waiting to devour your your faith. But uh, in the book, you, you all bring up some really interesting points and, and facts and, and ideas pertaining to these two topics that I think the average person who was raised in an evangelical world like myself might not be aware of. And so I don't really have any specific question other than to ask one of you or all of you to chime in and kind of lead us, wade us into these these waters a little bit and leave us uh, thirsty for more <laughs> when we're done here. I'll get us started. Uh, thanks. And I would want to say that when one looks just at these two centuries mm -hmm. um, and looks at everything or as much as one can, one doesn't find any real sense that someone is somehow deciding what books count and what books do not. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would want to suggest is um, nobody is um, doing much uh, to somehow see what the best books are. And you, you simply don't have uh, people uh, who are going around looking at other groups and saying, no, don't read that, read that, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Uh, for me, one of the most wonderful uh, examples of that is a relative conservative in the late second century, Irenaeus. And Irenaeus is, uh, might have been, uh, he claims to be the first person who says, um, which four gospels should you read? Mm. And it, indeed, he says, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. But what's really wonderful for me about this pretty strongly conservative person um, uh, among the many kinds of uh, leanings that one has in the first two centuries, he, he says why there's four. And that is, there are four winds that blow, mm. and there's four corners to the earth. In other words, he's not saying do these four because they are the four mm. and they're all alike. Rather, he's, his main criteria for choosing these four is they're all different. Mm. Um, in other words, four winds that blow, mm. <laughs> um, four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, so his basic idea about having four, it has to do with diversity. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and no wonder then that um, actually, I would want to say for Irenaeus, Irenaeus would probably say something like any four will do. Mm. In other words, it's the diversity that matters. Mm. Um, in this and in, and what we know now from the last two two centuries of of what one's finding in North Africa and parts of, of the Mediterranean is that in fact we've got a good 25 gospels mm -hmm. um, uh, and and so the main thing to say about um, who's in charge and what they're saying is that they just didn't govern themselves like that, first of all. And secondly, when you find these um, statements, 
uh, that underlines uh, diversity. That, that's it. It turns out that we also have more or less three chapters on the stuff, Glenn, that you're wanting to talk about. Yeah. Um, and, and so one of the, the first chapter that we go out there, mm -hmm. we notice that heresy, for instance, doesn't mean bad stuff. <laughs> it means choices that you make. Yeah. Um, and, and so, in other words, eventually it gets piled in the bad stuff um, several centuries later. Mm -hmm. um, but when you talk about heresy initially, you talk about choices one makes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> and similarly, in that same chapter, um, basically, we lay out uh, a whole bunch of different um, voices that one has. Um, and, and we really come to say, basically, it is not at all, there's not a, a, a binary between the orthodox and the, and the heresy, but it's a much more complex diversity. The next, um, well, no, I should I say this, then the final chapter does the same thing with the, the voices of Jesus in the second century. And that uh, in, in, in chapter 16, there we have, uh, we just take a look at a bunch of Jesuses and see how diverse those Jesuses are. They're, they're hardly the same person. Yep. We actually had some uh, back and forth in that, those two years, whether we would want to say it's many Jesuses. Mm. Um, uh, as, as what's there when you look at especially the second century. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, and I, I, the, the, one of my favorite things uh, in, the, in chapter 16 is this um, verse or, or several verses at the beginning of the secret revelation of John. Mm -hmm. And there you've got a picture of God and it turns out the picture of God is really wildly different, even within the five verses that are there. So I was afraid and I watched and behold, a child appeared to me. Then he changed himself into the form of an old man. I did not understand this wonder, whether it is a woman having numerous forms or it is a likeness that is, has three aspects. Then the person says, John, why are you doubting and fearing? For you are not a stranger to this likeness. Do not be hearted. I am the one who dwells with you always. I am the father, the mother, and the son. I am the one who exists forever, undefiled and unmixed. So anyway, it goes on a little bit more. But uh, even when you get in the same um, text, you have the text itself is making uh, a multiply faced God. Uh, I think your your question, Glenn, um, is is most telling with Gnosticism, and um, that's where I think to a certain extent we've done. Um, We've taken recent work of the last 30 years, and it turns out in this case, um, we, were, we were able to, to depend on um, several, um, um, several real good positions, and that's one Karen King. Um, whose book on Gnosticism basically punched a hole in everything. Um, she points out that the word Gnosticism doesn't even exist in the ancient world at all. Yeah. And the, really the first time it does exist is in the uh, late 17th or early 18th century. Mm. And that was uh, a, a, a basically a... Um, a word that meant to call Catholics a bad name mm. by Protestants. Um, um, 
<clears throat> what also then happens, and, and King um, and Williams at, at um, University of Washington does a lot of this as well. They worked together for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, what, what we um, see is that the real thing that started happening in the late 19th and early 20th century with all of that is all of these new discoveries. Mm -hmm. Gnosticism was not a word of, of import, even in the 17th and 18th century. Mm -hmm. But when people started discovering new kinds of texts, then all of a sudden, I would want to say that basically what that, they needed a, a, a bad word for, for all of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, so for instance, when the Nag Hammadi, uh, um, and and um, Aaron has really been uh, helpful in, in us really pinning this down. When, when the New York Times um, ba basically made the, the, the discovery or co covered the discovery of, of the Nag Hammadi in 1945, that... Um, is the first time the word is of uh, Gnosticism is used. Yeah. And it is applied to all of the 52 things they found in the mm -hmm. um, uh, So um, this, as far as I'm concerned, uh, was really positively um, a clear, it took King and Williams a long time to be able to say that in public. Mm. But um, they found that this is really, it's, it's a code name for heresy. Yeah. yeah. So that's my quick three chapters. Um, uh, and, and it was a good synopsis. Both, both, <laughs> both, both Aaron and Brandon, I'm sure, uh, have stuff to jump in on. The only thing I would add is I when you actually survey all the data, one of the most common terms by which these groups identify themselves is the Greek word mathetes, which usually gets translated as disciples, mm. e ecclesiastical speak. It really means just students. Yep. So school is one of the dominant ways they think about themselves. And they're largely holding discussion groups. Uh, they're not formal schools in, mm -hmm. in the way we think of schools, but they're informal schools. And schools teach. And one of the things ancient schools do is innovate. And heresis, from which the, which is the Greek word, which gets transliterated as heresy, just means you make choices about the things that get taught. And that's the way the word's used in the second century. And that's what they think is going on. They're making school choices. Schools mm. learn things. They innovate. They explore. And th that's what's going on. Mm. Uh, so it's, it, I, it, Hal's right, it really, they are exploring all this stuff. And there's, it, this is kind of a simple way to say it, but they're making it up as they go along. And I don't mean making it up and just creating it out of nothing, sure. but they're exploring it and seeing what's going on. Where does this lead? It leads, sometimes it leads in one way and say, oh, we got to pull that back or it leads this way, oh, we got, so it's, it's a constant adjustment mm -hmm. and it's very diverse and very widespread. And they're not so much concerned about eliminating things as they are about exploring new things. Yeah, that's really good. I think I had a uh, David Brackey on the show a while ago, and he said that it's almost like heresy was the Greek word referred to like a, a school and like almost like a school yeah. of thinking, like mm -hmm. uh, right. you have different schools of medicine where different people practice medicine in different ways. doesn't make one of them right, one of them wrong. It's just that they're exploring their own their own way and it was similar to what you were just saying yeah mm -hmm. so how would you know just a quick quick kind of question to go off of that is you know maybe talk for just a moment to the people listening who like me were told growing up that this stuff is off limits and how you've created an amazing resource in the new new testament to kind of bring makes those texts feel a lot less threatening to people like me who are raised in that world because they're side by side with the other the text that i'm used to but what would you say to the person listening who really wants to 
maybe they're, they're interested in this. They want to kind of dabble a little bit more, but they're hesitant to reach into it. Like what, what can these texts do for somebody if they reach into it and they, they start to read them? I can say a word about this um, because I was such a, a jerk about it for so long. Um, um, you know, I basically, my education um, uh, through all of the levels just shoved aside all of the new discoveries. Yeah. Didn't teach us much at all about it. And, <clears throat> but what happened is that basically the public started reading them, hmm. even when we scholars hardly ever did. Um, and and I can't say how many times in the 1980s and the 1990s, someone would come up to me after a speech and say, hey, I saw some, th th this new um, discovery was happening. And, and I would say something like, oh, it's just a bit of heresy and, and off in the corner. Don't bother about it, as I had been told myself. And then pretty soon, those people in the public would say back to me, no, it's not. I read it. Yeah. So in other words, it's actually not, it's, it really wasn't in the first two generations. It wasn't us smart scholars who did it. From, from my point of view, it was the, the public hmm. that, that was so thirsty for something else. Hmm and a broader connection that basically the, the public insisted that we learn. And literally, I went, I, I didn't have my Coptic on me. So I, I took 10 years to learn Coptic so we could, and, and as soon as I did that, and one of the most important schools in, in this field, um, we got flooded by, having a new a PhD um, uh, track mm -hmm. to uh, do non-canonical, extra-canonical work. So that's, that's my story, is what a jerk I was <laughs> and how I got to really actually be in the first level of a whole bunch of people who are now in, in schools teaching the stuff uh, like they wanted to for 20 years before. Yeah. I came after it a little differently. I got interested in graduate school in the parables. Uh, and that very quickly led me to the Gospel of Thomas, which is outside of the canonic, the, the three synoptic gospels, the only other place you find parables, really. And so I got into Coptic in graduate school just to get into the Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. And I remember a debate when I was a, too wet behind the ears to know different. Uh, I got into a debate at a Catholic Biblical Association meeting with Ray Brown, uh, who said, this, this Thomas stuff, the Gospel of Thomas stuff, this is, you don't need to pay any attention to it. It's nuts. It's just Gnostic. <laughs> and I, I should have caught, stopped myself. But I replied, well, if it's Gnostic, it's no more Gnostic than the Gospel of John. I mean, if you just read them and compare them, John, if you're going to use the category Gnostic, at that time I didn't know that I should doubt the category. Look at the Gospel of John. Well, then of course he had to really go after me, but but I think it's it's a correct point. If you you know the passage that John, that Hal read from Secret Revelation, that's there's nothing in there that you can't find in one of the canonical Gospels. Yeah. It's it's more explicit in some ways. But it's still there. And yeah. so you see this stuff everywhere. It's not just, I mean, I, if you want to understand, if your goal is to understand the New Testament, one of the best ways to do it is see all the other works of which it is a part. And that's, right. that's all this stuff in the first and second century. If you want to understand the pastorals, the best thing to do is to read the Acts of Petra and Felicita. I mean, sorry, the Acts of Thecla, Paul and Thecla because they're written about the same thing and they're arguing about the same issues. So, you know, I think from just a narrow confessional point of view, it helps you understand those texts you think are revelatory. Yeah, helps you see things differently. I know for myself, just reading, reading them side by side, it's like, oh, like things I thought I understood in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
would have a much different light when I would read something in the gospel of Thomas or the gospel of Mary or whatever, like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't think of it this way before, but now it kind of informs my reading of these other texts as well. Yeah. You know, Aaron, I know that your story is different because you're not near as old as we are. Um, uh, well, why don't you tell Glenn a little bit about um, your beginning um, relationships to this diversity? Uh, wow, this conversation could go on for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say we're we're, we're, I, we're coming up on our on our on our forty minutes. I, I misjudged our time a little bit. <laughs> I know. I I think you know in in my case, what um, what really drew me into um, the study of of this period and and what drew me to trying to to hear the voices of, of people in this period was. Um, actually an experience of reading the Gospel of John in an undergraduate classroom and acting out the scene near the end of the Gospel of John where Mary sees Jesus in the garden for the first time. Um, and, and I got to play the role of Mary in, in the classroom. And, um, and that experience just blew me away, especially because I, I hadn't realized what kinds of possibilities there were for um, women. Um, in this time period um, and in this context, but but also in um, in the study of what we now call the New Testament and of this period as well, um, and what continues to to pull me to this study into the study of these writings that are not included in in what we now have as the New Testament is is just how powerful a testimony these writings are to. The need for community and, and the need to find ways to belong to one another in, in supportive ways, especially in times of, of turmoil and, and violence, as Hal mentioned um, at the beginning of our time, we're, we're living in a time of such chaos, um, such chaos and, and violence. Um, we need, we need hope um and and we need to find ways to belong to each other to to figure out how we can exist in in supportive relationship to each other and that's what these communities were trying to do in lots of different kinds of ways and opening ourselves up to seeing how people were negotiating belonging um through all of these different writings i, I think can give us hope and and potential models for our own life and work so good that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have time for one more topic? I don't want to keep anybody longer than they are able to be kept. <laughs> I'm retired. I have plenty of time. Plenty of time. <laughs> All the time in the world. How about uh, Hal and Aaron? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we've got to talk about Paul. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so the last question, uh, Apostle Paul, um, again, in the world that I was brought up in, uh, Paul, Paul is the man. Right. Like I, I, I always was taught that in order to truly understand Jesus, you have to really deeply understand Paul. And uh, although I wasn't necessarily taught it verbatim, the, the vibe I got was that although Jesus taught nice stuff, uh, Paul came to tell us what Jesus really meant. And so Paul was kind of painted as this authoritative figure uh, who's always been a central pillar to the church uh, from day one. And nobody kind of dare should question that. But in the book, um, you suggest that he may not have played such as as prominent of a role in the church as many of us were taught that he always did. And so maybe you could talk to us a little bit about uh, what roles did Paul play or maybe didn't play in the eyes of the earliest uh, Jesus followers and maybe a little bit about how on earth did he become people become so obsessed with him as <laughs> with Pauline theology uh, over the course of the of the years? Well, this is a really good example to illustrate the problem the book is trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul becomes this kind of dominant character because of the New Testament, because he dominates the New Testament. You know, more than 50% of the New Testament is taken up with Paul, and therefore, we tend to think, we've traditionally thought that that's what was going on in the first two centuries. Right. Paul's everything. Yeah. Why? Because he's everything in the New Testament, and that's what's telling us about these first two centuries. Mm -hmm. Well, as Hal says, we now have these new documents that say, wait a minute, 
that's not what's going on. When you really start to look at the two, first two centuries, Paul's pretty absent. Yeah. <laughs> He's just not being quoted by people. Right. And the people who quote him are the people who belong to the churches he founded. So he's really viewed in the second century, not as a theologian or a letter writer, but as a church founder. Mm -hmm. And actually, you can see that if you read the book of Acts. Acts doesn't, never talks about him writing letters, never mentions any kind of theological position that Paul has. He just tells you the churches he found. Mm -hmm. So that when Clement, for example, writes uh, to uh, Corinth, he mentions one of Paul's letters. Why? Because not because he's all that enamored of Paul, but he knows those people value Paul as the founder of their church. So that he becomes much more a church founder, a kind of missionary. And that's really his position in the second century. He's, he's not really viewed as a theologian. The only person who really shows a lot of interest in him is Marcion. Uh, and he does is the first one to kind of construct, not a New Testament, but, and not even exactly a scripture, but he, he constructs a collection based around a, a, an addition, some kind of addition of a gospel like Luke and a collection of Pauline letters. But there's no evidence that Martian is quoting them or that they're reading them in services or anything like that. Uh, in fact, Jason DeBoon is one of the best scholars on Martian says, they just kept them in a box. <laughs> you know, that's what you do with writings in the ancient world. You put them in a box. Put them uh, under the bed. <laughs> well, people don't read the way we do. I mean, yeah. the, there's a big part of the book in the second, in the last chapter that deals with this. The whole, these people function out loud. They don't point, function in a culture of literacy the way we think they do. Hmm. But so, I mean, Paul is, he's, he's just, He's, he's an important figure for those communities that he founded. Yeah. Uh, in the Acts of Paul and Thecla, it's, it's called the Acts of Paul and Thecla, and Aaron always says it should be called the Acts of Thecla. And she's right, because yeah. Thecla dominates the whole writing. Paul just kind of gets in the way. But <laughs> I think the importance of that is that the, that book is trying to say, we belong to the Pauline tradition. We belong to that group of churches that were founded by Paul. And when you think about it that way, then you can see that the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which were probably written around 150, and the Pastorals, which were written around 150, 1st Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, they're arguing with each other. They are contesting out these, these roles about gender and church authority and who does what. Thecla's bending everything. Uh, and she represents one side, and 1st Timothy represents the other side. This is a debate going on within these kinds of community. It's not about Paul's theology. It's just about claiming his authority. You know, it's, you look in vain in 1 Timothy for any idea what Paul's about. Yeah. Uh, in fact, 1 Timothy takes positions that are diametrically opposed to the Pauline letters. So yeah. it's, it's much more con conflictive and much more diverse and much more argumentative than, than we've seen it. Mm. I don't know if that helps, but <laughs> yeah, and that helps a lot. So how how like how well known do you think Paul would have been to the churches that he didn't actually found? Like, because again, in my in my history, in my upbringing, it was the idea was everybody knew who Paul was in the first two centuries. But like, how how not true or how true is that? <laughs> well, when you look around, I think there's large numbers of communities that don't know him at all. Yeah. There are numbers of communities that know him as a church founder. Mm -hmm. Hardly any of the communities start to think about him as a theologian. That doesn't happen until much later. Origen is really one of the first ones who begins to think about Paul as a theologian. Mm -hmm. The one who really does it is Augustine. So it's, it's a combination of Paul dominating the text of the New Testament as that becomes a canonical text. And that's in the late 4th and 5th century. When that really happens, mm. and Augustine's influence, and then the Reformation's influence with Luther mm. and Calvin. It, that's the moves that put Paul central. If you read Thomas Aquinas, who's not an Augustinian, for mm. example, he doesn't follow Augustine, he hardly ever quotes Paul. <laughs> Paul's just not on his agenda. <laughs> and he's the major theologian in the Middle Ages. So, 
that's kind of an interesting move. So yeah. it, it's it's been a very varied move. We look through very narrow lenses when we look back to the first century. And that's what this book is trying to get away from. It's trying to look forward and look at the wideness and the variety, not through some telescope back to the first century. Yeah. I feel like for, for me, just reading reading the book, and I don't know if this is the um, the hope that you had that your readers would take away from it, but for this particular section on Paul, a lot of the time, a lot of the pushback I get with the podcast on social media and stuff would be like, well, what about about this verse from Paul says this, I've become more comfortable and kind of, if, if I don't have like an explanation for that particular verse, just saying why maybe, maybe Paul wasn't exactly correct in, in his thinking on this particular issue. Like it's allowed me to loosen my grip a little bit on Paul because I, I was taught so much growing up that Paul is so important and you have to be able to integrate every piece of his theology into yours. And if you can't, then you're wrong and he's right. But now I've, I've become a little bit more free, I guess, in thinking of these early, these early people didn't maybe even know who Paul was, but yet they got along just fine as a follower of the way. And so I feel, yeah. feel like maybe I could do the same. <laughs> uh, I think Paul's important. I mean, I wrote a book sure. on Paul and I like yeah. Paul, Yeah. Uh, but I also think he's nuts in some ways. Too. <laughs> I think you have, you have to reserve that, you have to reserve the right to argue they yeah. certainly were arguing with everybody. Yeah. And that's one of the things you can take away from this. That's, you know, that arguing is important. That's how you innovate. That's how you begin to move forward and understand things. Really and good. There's a lot of arguing going on in the first two centuries. Yeah. And Glenn, um, the one of the person, one of the seminar people who um, did a key paper for us um, about Paul, he he is very clear that he that he thinks that Paul even argued against himself, mm. um, uh, uh, and 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 that that was simply a pedagogical thing to do. Yeah, um, is to to bring uh, multiplicities into it. So I, it's it, um, moderns t- looking at texts need to know that in many ways uh, the ancients were much more free uh, about um, what how one got to meaning yeah and, and you need to this has to do with the technology when we write something down it's fixed when they write something down it moves into their memory mm-hmm. and memory is much more flexible than what <laughs> you find in print that's for sure so, <laughs> so there's a there's a flexibility built into the system in yeah. the ancient world that's really good well hey we are just about um out of time we are out of time but this has been uh, a lot of fun and i could talk to the three of you all day uh, but thank you for taking the time to join me and my listeners and before i let you go uh, real quick is there any maybe place on the internet you'd like to point us to any um, of your websites or your blogs or your books or anything like that that you'd like to tell us about the only place I'm blogging these days is a, a place called Early Christian um, Texts. Okay. Um, um, that's, that would be one place. I'll put that in the I show notes. I blog at westarinstitute.com. Okay. Yeah, I was going to recommend the Westar Institute page as well. Um, we're still doing a lot of work in the second phase of the Christianity Seminar, looking at the next couple of centuries. So. Uh, we have a lot of upcoming events as well that listeners might want to check out. So for sure, head over to the Westar Institute website. Awesome. I'll put all the links to that in the show notes. And this was a lot of fun. So thanks uh, for taking Thank the time for me. Thank you so much for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for Thank dealing you. with all three of us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely.